next whatever we have discussed so far up to that there will be exam for you uh the next uh, tuesday okay uh, the left out features we will discuss after that today there will be some hands on hands on means you will actually um, uh, go them uh, have you joined i hope yes i am there okay okay so he will be showing you some practical example uh, and how you can actually uh, execute one ml algorithm how you can run them in on some embedded scenario and what type of model we can choose one practical algorithm how you can map them and based on that you will be a simple trick to that ex um, whatever he will be showing you have to do by your own and that will be your first assignment okay so first uh, let's see how we can so far we have discussed so many things that we have this type of cnn um, steps we have some dsp processors or some processor where we will be implementing this ml algorithms and it will ex actually execute we uh, we will see the prediction or we want to see the prediction in a uh, real time so today we will see one actual demo one actual example where you can see the example of one um, again one some voice detection and based on that how the prediction is working okay one thing i want to tell for some of you maybe you are thinking for this course this is in this course we are not entirely going to uh, discuss about machine learning or we are not entirely going to discuss about embedded process what we will be doing you will see in turn every time we will toggle between two things so far as you have seen we have discussed some basic about that uh, ml algorithm structures especially the deep learning uh, dnn part we are focusing on because that, that is the most costly in terms of performance in terms of resource requirement and on the other hand when we are actually uh, mapping to some practical algorithms dnn has their immense i mean popularity there there are multiple examples multiple applications in different fields maybe exactly the the example one electrical engineer will take the uh, computer science engineer will not apply the for the machine learning the basic structure of the algorithm in the same type of application that will never happen that also we understand but in between if you take this machine learning as a black box as of now and if you think about your own applications from your own domain you will see what you have to do for all of you you have to tweak the input set a bit like in the class whatever we have discussed about that uh, hearing it they are the speech processing signal from there they are forming that spectrogram maybe in your case the input you will tweak a bit and you will make it suitable to um i mean use that as the input to your cnn model and then after that starting from there to that prediction part this whole block this execution these steps are same for all of you so that's why the, if you think your application and you take this this ml embedded ml as a block you have to just manipulate if you understand how this block is working if you get the framework of it actually what you have to do you have to tweak the inputs from your own example from your own domain and if you can uh, insert those inputs to these cnn blocks embedded uh, ml blocks what we are going to discuss um, today and um, the algorithm optimization strategy uh, in the coming weeks so you can understand that is same for all of you because after that these steps the ml steps those are same for all of you in spite of the fact that you are choosing different types of applications okay so we are talking in that block so gautam will be showing one example maybe uh, gautam you can take over you can share your screen and explain them what is the example and how okay. we are going to map them to the ml okay. is my screen visible hello yes yes 
okay so so i would like to give a demo and uh, so before going into the practical demo uh, so i would like to uh, give a glimpse of some uh, few technical terms so which i will be referring while giving the demo so uh, so what machine learning actually is so for suppose if uh, imagine you own a machine right uh, that manufacture with gets sometimes it may break down uh, so so whenever it just break down it is uh, very expensive to repair so perhaps uh, there is a mechanism uh, that would tell us before it breaks down so we can halt the operation and prevent it from uh, breaking it down so uh, it is where this uh, machine learning actually comes into the picture so basically so if you collect data about the machine uh, during operation so we might be able to predict uh, when it is about to break down that halt the operation before uh, damage occurs actual damage occurs so fundamentally uh, this machine learning is a technique uh, for using uh, computers uh, to predict things uh, based on past observations so basically we collect so in our case i have already told you to uh, there is a machine some uh, factory machine we collect data about that factory machine's performance and uh, that create a computer program that analyzes the data and uses it to predict uh, the future states so coming uh, so to create a machine learning program uh, so uh, actually a programmer uh, feeds data into a special kind of algorithm and uh, lets the algorithm uh, discover the rules for suppose if you are operating on a complex data so without having to understand all the complexity ourselves so uh, the machine learning algorithm uh, builds a model so it builds a model of the system uh, based on the data we provide so uh, this process of providing data to the model is known as the training and the model is a type of a computer program so uh, so are you there uh, am i audible right hello yes yes sir yes okay right so this model is basically a, a type of a computer program so we run data through this model to make predictions so that is uh, this pro uh, that process uh, where we make this prediction is known as the interference the process where we provide the data to the model uh, that is the training and uh, so where we do the actual prediction that is the interference so basically the type of programs may be this uh, classification pro uh, problem uh, we may use uh, to solve the classification problem for suppose in the case of machine uh, there may be a uh, normal operation or abnormal operation there can be two states so given the, the uh, inputs uh, we can output the probabilities of uh, where this machine actually lies in either of these two states so depending upon the scores uh, we may uh, able to judge okay whether this machine is uh, in a normal operation or is in uh, abnormal operation so there may be uh, different approaches to uh, machine learning so one of the most popular uh, uh, is uh, deep learning so uh, which is uh, based on a simple idea how the human brain uh, might work so in deep learning uh, we have a, a network of uh, neurons so basically they are uh, represented by array of numbers uh, they are basically trying to model the relationship between the various inputs and outputs on various iterations we adjust the uh, values uh, these values associated with uh, neurons basically known as these uh, weights and bias so based on the iterations uh, we adjust this value so that uh, it model the output of the model is close to the actual value so uh, next uh, going to the next slide uh, so here is the workflow so uh, whenever we start uh, uh, to try a model first we decide on the goal so whenever uh, you are designing any kind of algorithm so it's important to start by establishing exactly what you want to do so what the problem is about so i have already taken this uh, classification problem so so the machine may be in normal or abnormal state so uh, yeah that may be the goal this uh, it depends upon the problem what you are actually looking for and based on the goal you go for the next step that is the collect a data sheet so it's difficult to know how exactly how much data is required to train an effective model so but actually the more the data the better the model will be so uh, you should aim uh, to collect data that represents the full range of conditions and events uh, that can occur in a system so uh, in our case uh, uh, the factory machine example i have taken earlier so we may take the data as a set of time series uh, meaning a series of readings uh, collected on a periodic basis 
so as i've already mentioned uh, so uh, in the case of factory machine uh, we may represent this normal abnormal operation so we may take a series of information like the temperature or uh, if there is a motor involved in the machine we may take the rotations per uh, these are like input data some of the input data may be like uh, taken once per minute or other data can be taken uh, once per 10 seconds if you pass uh, in only the data available at a given moment it might not include all the types of data for suppose temperature is taken uh, once every minute and for the other parameter may be taken uh, once per 10 second so if you pass uh, only the data given at a given moment it might not include all the types of data we, uh, that are available so we may choose a window we may take the average values and uh, if we average all the values in the window uh, for each time series so we end up with a set of single values it's just an example uh, you can follow other thing so for the training all uh, for the training algorithm to work effectively the values needed to be in similar in size for suppose temperature it may be in fahrenheit and the uh, it may be like 98 and some other parameter like 2 3 so we need to normalize the data so ideally uh, it is if the all the values are expressed as numbers in the range of 0 to 1 it will be easy for the model uh, to actually analyze so that is uh, basically the normalization of the data so now coming to the uh, training the model so uh, as i have already mentioned training is the process by which a model learns to produce the correct output for a given set of inputs so it involves feeding training data through a model and uh, making small adjustments to the weights and biases of the neurons associated as i have told you before so there will be neurons there will be layers of neurons the first layer second layer and there will be weights and bias associated with the neurons so based on the training data uh, so uh, uh, we adjust the weights and biases, uh, biases of the neurons so that the output which gives which is uh, uh, it goes approximation to the desired values so when the data is fed into the network so it is basically transformed by successive mathematical operations as i was told earlier that the weights uh, that involve these weights and biases in each layer the output of the model uh, is the result of running the input through these operations and uh, uh, the model's weight start out with random values these weights and biases they start out with random values and uh, while training the batches of data are fed into the model and the model's output is compared with the uh, desired output and uh, an algorithm called back propagation edges the weights and biases uh, incrementally uh, over the time so that the output of the model gets closer to the desired values so there will be layers there will be neurons the weights and biases attached with the neurons as we feed the uh, data in batches the weights and biases are uh, adjusted in such a way that the uh, the output of the model gets closer to the matching desired value so so at the point so it begins to make accurate predictions we compare the output at the point where it uh, predicts the uh, accurate uh, predictions so we say that the model is uh, converged to determine uh, when a model has converged we can analyze the graphs uh, okay i will be showing the uh, one example of a sign model uh, i will coming i will come to the point i will be discussing there about this so uh, one more thing that uh, these are the terms here uh, and light it in uh, red color this underfitting overfitting so uh, the two most common reason a model may fail uh, these are underfitting and overfitting so your neural network uh, learns to fit its behavior to the pattern it recognizes in data we are feeling the input data there might uh, it, uh, it recognizes the behavior of the input patterns so if a model is correctly fit it will produce the correct output so when a model is underfit so uh, it means like it has not been able to understand that uh, pattern that we are intending it to recognize this may happen because uh, uh, the maybe the architecture is too small to capture the complexity of the system uh, in that case we may go back to the uh, um, training model and we add layers the more and more layers we add uh, uh, we adjust the weights and biases or we may uh, change the model architecture so when the model is overfitting one more problem is overfitting so uh, in the case of overfitting the model has learned its training data too well and uh, you may be wondering why is that problem so the model is able to exactly predict uh, on its training data but the problem is if you are feeding a new data the model uh, that the model has not previously seen it is not able to predict correct value that is the overfitting problem so for suppose for example 
if you are uh, training a model to classify photos, okay, for suppose the photos of a dogs or cats, if all the dog photos are uh, taken outdoors and all the cat photos are taken indoors, okay, the model may learn to cheat and use the presence of sky in each photograph uh, to predict which animal it is. But we are expecting it to analyze the facial features of dogs and cats and uh, based on the facial features to distinguish it. But the model is trying to cheat. It is finding to uh, a shortcut way. It is uh, taking the presence of sky and determining whether it is a dog or cat. So this is uh, one of the examples where the model is overfitting. So if you provide a, a picture of a cat which is taken indoors, it is not able to predict it accurately. So the best way to beat overfitting, uh, so again, uh, we have to feed more data. So, uh, so to, get the, to get the model hands on a larger and more varied data set. So as I've already mentioned this, uh, more data, it will always help. And another key terms is training, validation, and testing. So uh, basically to assess the performance of a model, uh, we can look at how it performs on its training data. So however, uh, this only tells a part of the story, right? I've already told you, if you are uh, providing the training data, the model may overfit it, right? When, uh, if you feed a new input data, it may not be able to predict the data accurately. For that, what we do during the training, uh, so we have this validation data set too. So basically whatever the input data we have, we basically divide into three data sets, one for the training, one for the validation and another for the testing. So while training the data, uh, we uh, actually fill the validation data set also in order to look. So what are the parameters? How is the loss? How is the model performing on the validation data set? And uh, so uh, during training, uh, the training data set is used to train the model. And periodically, the data from the validation data set is fed through the model and the loss is calculated. And we will be able to see by comparing the training and validation loss, whether the model is overfitting or not. And you may be wondering why this testing so when we are validate, when we are running the validation data set, we may be adjusting the um, neurons uh, bias and weight values, but uh, it may also overfit the validation data. So that's why we're keeping aside some input data for testing. At the end, we do this testing and uh, we check whether the model is uh, working fine or not. And uh, finally, uh, after this training and all, we convert the model because the training happens in the Google Colob. Actually, the training cannot be done in a edge devices because of this, as you know, these edge devices, uh, embedded devices, these are resource constant. So actually we do this training in the Google Colob. I will be showing the example uh, in a time. So after this, uh, the training is usually done in the TensorFlow, but in order to run this model in the edge devices, we convert it into a TensorFlow light. There is basically a TensorFlow light tool uh, using it, we convert it. So uh, just uh, bringing it to the edge devices, we run the interference and uh, we try to evaluate and uh, troubleshoot. These are the final steps. So that's it about the workflow. And uh, now coming to the hello world of uh, TinyML. This is the hello world program of TinyML, TinyML. So here our goal is to try a model uh, that can take a value X and predict its sign Y. The second part of our project will be to run this model on a hardware device. So uh, I will be giving a demo on this hello world, but the actual assignment will be on a wake word detection. So are you guys there? Everything fine? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Yes, right, right. So yeah. Yeah, moving ahead. So the second part of our project uh, will be to run this model on a hardware device. Uh, so we are basically using this Arduino Nano 33B license. For the wake word detection, uh, it has already an inbuilt microphone. So that's why we are going for this uh, Arduino Nano. So as I already mentioned, uh, to create our machine learning model, uh, basically we will use a Python uh, TensorFlow and uh, Google's Colob, Colob battery. In short, it is called as Colob. So it is basically a cloud-based, uh, uh, interactive notebook for experimenting with Python uh, code. So to run our notebook, uh, we basically use this uh, Colob uh, because uh, on the edge, uh, because in edition, uh, machine learning can be computationally intensive. So the training these modules uh, may be slow on the uh, local machine. So that's why uh, we go for this Google Colob. And finally, as I was told, this converting the model for TensorFlow Lite 
uh, which is a set of tools uh, for running the TensorFlow models on edge devices. You can't just take this TensorFlow and directly run on edge devices because these edge devices are resource constraints. So we convert into a, a TensorFlow light and run on these edge devices. So yeah. So now uh, I will be showing you uh, this Google Colab. Uh, so are you able to see this sign model? Hello? Yes. Yes, OK. OK, uh, yeah. Here we are training the model, actually. So these are the steps I have already run. In order to run these cells, you have to click on this arrow button. So uh, in order to save time, I've already run this uh, uh, four cells. So I will be explaining one by one. So here, uh, I'm just importing the libraries, uh, whatever the libraries are required uh, for our current uh, uh, thing. And now, yeah. So uh, we are going to try and as I already told you, the input values will be H values and we have to predict the uh, its corresponding sign values. So we are going to train a network to model data generated by a sign function. So uh, actually this will result in a model that can take a value X and predict its sign Y. So here our plan uh, is to generate thousand values uh, that represent random points along a sine wave. Here the sample thousand values uh, that represent uh, random points along a sine wave. So, so our code will generate random h values uh, from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, so it will calculate the sign for each of these values. Uh, so you can see here we have used this uh, np random.c. So this method here, uh, np, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This method returns an array of uh, random numbers in the specified range. And second, after generating the data, uh, we basically shuffle it here, you can see. So if we do not shuffle it, uh, the model will be less accurate. Again, it will just uh, overfit the data. So in order to avoid it, so we generate the uh, random values by giving this np.random method. And uh, after that, we shuffle it. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, we calculate this sign values, uh, this uh, numpy sign method to calculate our sign values. So it can just, uh, uh, NumPy can do this for all our H values at once and uh, return an error. Here, uh, the plot is there. And uh, in order to, uh, here I'm adding a random noise for data points and draw another graph. This is much more uh, reflective to the real world situation in which uh, data is generally quite messy. So that's why here I've added some random noise. So, as I've already told here, the training test space, uh, this 60% uh, uh, for the training data set, I've already told the training data set validation training testing. So 60% of the input data is reserved for the training of the model and 20% uh, for the, uh, so here the different colors representing the training, validation, test data inputs. So basically the training set is a portion of a data set uh, that is used to uh, uh, fit a model for prediction. Uh, or classification of values uh, that are known in the training set. And the validation set is like a, a set of data uh, used to train the model with the goal of uh, finding and uh, uh, optimizing the best model to a given problem. To split our data, uh, we are basically using uh, this numpy method, the split method. So this method takes an array of data and uh, array of uh, indices, then chops the data. So actually we are just dividing the data into these uh, three sets, the training, validation, and testing. And here comes this model architecture. So yeah, you can see here. Uh, so to create our model, uh, we are going to design a simple neural network here. So the first layer uh, has a single input, our H value. Uh, so better I will show this here. Yeah, you can see this uh, deep learning network, right? Hello? Yes. Yeah. So. So here, in our case, the input will be only one cell, right? We are feeding just h value. So the first layer has a single input, our h value, and 16 neuron inputs. Uh, 16 neuron inputs. This input value will be fed to each of the 16 neurons. So uh, each neuron, so these cells are basically neuron in the layer one. Each neuron uh, will then be activated. 
system here. Yeah. yeah. So each neuron will then be activated to a certain degree. The amount of uh, activation for each neuron uh, is based upon its weights and bias values uh, learned during training. And uh, and also uh, in our network, uh, you can see here RELU activation uh, RELU. So so we are using this activation function called rectify linear unit. This is RELU. So it takes uh, uh, it outputs, uh, uh, it takes the input value. If the input value is negative, it will give uh, it, the RELU returns zero. And if the input value is above zero, the RELU returns it unchanged. If the input value is less than zero, it will give us, it will output us zero. If the input value is greater than zero, uh, it will uh, give us the input unchanged. So without this activation function, the neurons output would always be a linear function of its input. So actually sine wave is a non-linear. So that's why we're bringing this activation uh, numbers from our first layer. So the activation number from for, uh, our first layer will be fed as input to our second layer. In the second layer, there is only one neuron, as you can see here. In the first uh, layer, uh, in the first layer, actually the input is there. In the second layer, we have these 16 neurons. In the third layer, we have only one neuron. So the activation number from our first layer will be fed as input to our second layer. So which is defined here, yeah, the more add layer stains. So after this, because uh, this layer is a single neuron, it will receive 16 inputs. So first I'm, uh, I'm applying H value to 16 neurons in the second layer. And from the 16 layers output, I'm applying to the single neuron in the third layer. So actually there are four layers, one for the input and the last one for the output. And between there are two layers where there are neurons are there. In the second layer, we have 16 neurons. In the third layer, we have only one neuron. So in the third layer, there is a single neuron. It will receive 16 inputs, one each of the neurons in the previous layer. So its purpose is to combine all this activation from the previous layer into a single output value. So the output value is obtained by multiplying each input with its corresponding weight and summing the results and then adding the neurons bias. So each input with the corresponding weight plus the bias. So the compile step, you can see here uh, where it is. Yeah, this compile uh, step. Yeah, uh, in the code, uh, it uh, configures uh, uh, some important arguments used in the training process and prepares the model to be trained. So uh, the optimizer argument, you can uh, see here. Uh, yeah, this optimizer argument specifies the algorithm uh, that will adjust the network to model its input during training. And here the loss uh, argument specify the method uh, used during training to calculate how far the network's prediction are from reality. This is error kind of thing. So yeah, so the network we have just designed, uh, it consists of uh, two layers. Uh, so yeah, in the third and uh, in the second and third layer, there will be 16 neurons in the second layer and uh, one layer, uh, one neuron in the third layer. So. Uh one question this loss is it a loss or is it, it is a loss what we are allowing is it some kind of tolerance ma'am what ma'am it's yeah. a mean square error ma'am mean square error the predicted error. value actual value minus of uh, yeah ma'am mean square direct yeah ma mean square error yeah i will be showing here the address and all yeah so so our second layer has a single neuron, as I told earlier, uh, earlier, so which has 16 connections from the input. So one to each neuron in the first layer. So this makes the total number of connections as 32. So from the input to the 16 neuron system, from second layer to the third layer, in the second layer there's 16 neurons, in the third layer there's one neuron. So connection between these will give you another 16 connections, so total 32. 32 connections will be there. And since every neuron has a bias, so, in the second layer, we have 16 neurons. In the third layer, we have one neuron. So every neuron is associated with the bias. So there are total of 17 biases. So total parameters are like 49. So in order to train a model uh, in Keras, uh, we call this fit method, as you can see here. Yeah. So passing all of our uh, data and some other important arguments. So the first two arguments here, H train and Y train are basically the, our training data, H and Y values of our training data. And uh, the next step is EPOS. EPOS is nothing but this uh, iterations. So 
it specifies how many times our training set will be run through the network during training the more the epochs uh, the more the training will occur so uh, you might think that the more the more ha training happens the better the network will be but uh, however uh, some network will start to overfit the training data after a certain number of epochs so uh, so we, for now we might limit uh, it to uh, uh, we want to limit the amount of training we do in order to avoid overfitting so here we are starting out with 1000 uh, uh, epochs of training so when the training is complete uh, we can dig on the matrix right so after some epochs they will just saturate there will not be any change so we can stop uh, we can know when it is happening and uh, coming to the batch size batch size so uh, the batch size argument specifies how many pieces of uh, training data to feed into the network before uh, measuring its accuracy and updating its weights and biases so if you wanted we could uh, specify batch size of 1 right batch size of 1 but uh, so we uh, so it means that we had run interference on a single data point measuring the loss uh, loss of network prediction update the bias and uh, weights and biases but it will take a lot of time right so if we if you choose a higher batch size for suppose 600 if you choose so each batch size will include all of our training data we are now to make only one update to the network every epoch so it will be much quicker quicker right if we take more batch size higher batch size but the problem is when i take a batch size high batch size uh, so it results in less accurate models so when choosing a batch size uh, we are making a compromise between training efficiency and model accuracy if you choose a batch size of one so so each each interface the, we will be updating the weights and biases it will take a lot of computation but if you take a batch size of 600 even higher so it will be very quicker and the result will be uh, it, it will result in less accurate models so when choosing a batch size uh, so we are making a compromise here the training efficiency and the model accuracy so this is where we specify our validation data set so uh, data from this data set will be run through the network uh, through the training process and the network prediction will be compared with the expected values here so uh, coming to this parameters as you can see here the output values the loss the mean absolute error the, uh, this is for the training set and this is for the validation set right uh, as we move on these iterations and we finally what we get a lot of shit yeah as you can uh, see here uh, so basically the loss is what the loss is uh, uh, this is the output for our loss function we are uh, using mean square error which is expressed as a positive number generally the smaller the loss value the better the system is and the, this is mean absolute error uh, this is the uh, of our training data as uh, so it shows the average difference between the network's predictions and the expected y values from the training data set and these are the corresponding data set for the validation data set uh, so so we can see here the loss is high pretty high 0.015 so in order to improve this model what we can do so in order to uh, so here this showing the training and validation loss so in order to uh, yeah here uh, there is a one more graph you can see here so it is a linear thing it is failing to understand the non linearity as you can see here is just straight line in the trough in the crest it is somewhat okay it is uh, detecting some non linearity but in the when it comes to the trough it is just a straight line so it is failing to learn the non linearity of the sine wave which we are expecting it to do so in order to improve this model uh, so what we can do so we can uh, add an additional layer of uh, 16 neurons in the middle so previously as i have told there are four layers so in between the layer 2 and layer 3 we are adding one more layer with 16 neurons the same thing and again i am running the uh, uh, this uh, these values again i am comparing it so this time this yeah as you can see this time uh, this loss values have uh, 
decreased a bit, right? Zero point zero one six one one six, and also the training loss and the validation loss they are uh, same, bit same, right? So so our uh, model is working fine on the validation data set also, as it is for the training data set, and you can plot uh, here the sine wave as you can see. So previously it was a straight line in the trough, but now it is uh, okay. It is uh, detecting some nonlinearity. We have improved the system by adding more and more layers. So that's what my intention is. If you want to improve the model, so you can uh, uh, improve. You can add uh, just like these layers in between, uh, as you can see here. So, so now uh, after this, yeah. After this, what we do? We convert. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, hello, are you there? Everything is clear. Any query in between? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hello, sir. Yeah. I had one question. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Uh, as you said that epochs are the number of iterations that we take. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, you said epochs were the number of iterations that we take. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when we take batch size. So those mm -hmm. thousand it uh, for each batch those thousand iterations take. Mm -hmm. uh, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We just start out with thousand uh, some random value of epochs, and we uh, as you have seen it right the MAE the loss parameter they saturate after a certain number of epochs. So by that we will be able to know how many times we have to run. It's like a trial and error. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, I had a question. Uh, so, how do we decide the number of neurons in a layer, or like the number of layers? Is it just like observation, or is there some method to like, get? Uh, actually, it depends upon the design parameter. Uh, so, what you are looking for. So, we initially start with 16 neurons. We don't want a complex network first. If it is working fine, as we have, uh, I have shown it right. I have used 16 neurons and in the second layer and one neuron in the third layer. The model was not able to predict accurately, so I have I have included one more layer in between, right? Okay. So it's like a trial and error, so you have to adjust it accordingly. It depends upon the okay. problem actually. If the problem is quite complex, so your architecture might be very small to understand the complexity of the input data. So in that case, you go to the model architecture and make necessary changes. So it is purely depends upon the what you are looking for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So after that, uh, what we do? Uh, so we convert this uh, tensor uh, into so this kind of, uh, so we have this TensorFlow Lite model till now, right? In order to make it run in the edge devices, uh, we have to convert into the TensorFlow Lite. So we use this TensorFlow Lite converter to convert uh, it into the TensorFlow Lite, and uh, we have this interpreter, uh, the TensorFlow Lite interpreter. Uh, this runs an appropriately converted a TensorFlow Lite model using the most efficient operations for a given device. device. They are device specific. So because uh, it's designed primarily for efficiency, that is TensorFlow Lite interpreter, it is uh, slightly more complicated uh, uh, to use than the Keras, the actual TensorFlow. Because uh, so in the, as you know, in this edge devices, we have uh, these uh, resource constraints. So we can't just bring this TensorFlow directly into the edge device. And finally, uh, we convert it into a C file using HSD command. You can run in the Google Colab itself. So after we have uh, converted into the uh, C file, so basically, yeah, let me show you this Arduino. Yeah, are you able to see this Arduino IDE? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that C file will basically output uh, these values. Okay. So you have to from there in the Google Colab. It will output a file. That file you should copy in this Arduino ID. So finally, this is what you get. So now your model is ready. So uh, once the model is ready, now uh, so, you, so now we have to work with TensorFlow Lite. So as I've already mentioned, ten, working with TensorFlow Lite is uh, basically a complex, a slightly more complicated than the what we are using till now, the Keras API, which we have used in the TensorFlow. So it is slightly complicated. So we have to, okay, let me uh, show you this. 
so you are uh, you are able to see this word file right hello yes, yes. sir yes sir so yes. this is basically the code which i am going to discuss with you now we have the model so we have the model but the model cannot do anything right so to use our model so we have converted this uh, tensorflow model into tensorflow lite we have uh, we have uploaded it into arduino but in order to use it uh, using our edge devices to uh, so we need to wrap this code uh, that sets up the necessary environment for it to run so it provides the input uses its output to generate behavior right so for that what we do you can see here the first two lines so uh, these are basically this macros wrap the rest of our code uh, in the necessary apparatus for it to be executed by the tensorflow lite for microcontrollers so the second macro uh, so it adds up an argument uh, so in this case uh, the argument uh, being passed is a uh, load model and uh, perform interference this program is a test then and when the tests are run it will output along with the test results so that we can see whether the test passed or failed so we are creating an environment in order to use the model we are providing the input we can check the outputs so here uh, you can see uh, this error reporter so it provides a mechanism for uh, logging uh, debug information during interference so if there is any error occurring it will just report us uh, so uh, finally uh, here uh, this code here we use a get met, uh, get model function in order to get the function g underscore sign so just a minute i will show you here you can see right our model's name is g underscore model right so here yeah ham uh, getting the model and storing in this model variable so before uh, using the model we just compare it with the tf flight schema version the model version whether it is equal to the tf flight uh, uh, schema version so the problem is uh, if you do not check this if there is a mismatch in the uh, uh, versions uh, between the model that we have downloaded and the model and the tf flight schema version so uh, it might result in strange behavior that is uh, tricky to debug so it is better practice to check uh, if the versions are same if the versions are same uh, we go ahead and uh, here uh, you can see we create an instance of all ops resolver so so uh, till now we uh, as i mentioned in our uh, uh, the machine learning model is composed of various mathematical operations right that uh, transform input into output so there are uh, these mathematical operations so uh, this all ops resolver class knows all of these operations that are available for tensorflow lite for microcontrollers see we have a machine learning model so it needs to use mathematical operations right in order to transform input to outputs so all these operations that are used, available for tensorflow lite so is known by this all ops resolver, uh, resolver so after we call this we have all these operations uh, whatever the operations we need and then we define the tensorflow area size so we have this input we need to allocate a so this area of memory so will be used to store models input output and the intermediate tensors and all so we call it as a tensor arena so in our case uh, so you might be wondering how this value we have uh, so 2 into 1024 so so basically uh, we are working with edge devices we want to use uh, we want to reduce the size as far as possible right so that's why we express this array size as n into 1024 so so it's just easy to scale the number up and down which is just by changing the value of n so while keeping it a multiple of 8 so to find the correct array size so we start with fairly higher value for suppose 70 into 1024 then we just keep on reducing until the model no longer runs so the last number that worked is the correct one so this is a uh, uh, and then we go for this uh, interpreter uh am i going fast hello okay no sir okay right yeah so here so uh, yeah so here we are basically uh, allocating the tensor uh, area so first we uh, declare a micro interpreter named interpreter Uh, so this class is the heart of the tensorflow lite for microcontrollers 
so it is a magical piece of code that will execute our model on the data we provide so so here we are passing most of the objects we have created so far this uh, and then make a call to the allocate tensors here the allocate tensors this allocate tensors so we have the tensor area right so this allocate tensor method uh, walks through all of the tensors defined by the model and assigns memory from the tensor arena to each of them so suppose we have this model so it will assign area this uh, uh, what is this allocate tensors so it's critical that we call allocate tensors before attempting to run interference because the otherwise the interference will fail because uh, yeah so then again to grab a pointer to an input tensor uh, we call this interpreter's input method since a model can have multiple input tensors uh, we need to pass an index here zero so yeah uh, method that specifies which tensor we want there can be uh, multiple input tensors so which tensor we are interested in so that's why we pass this index and and here tf light uh, so any any basically it uh, compares whether they are not equal so input it should not be null pointer right there should be something in input it compares it if there is input is null pointer uh, so it will report an error otherwise it will just move on so it is not equal any denotes not equal and eq denotes equal so so here uh, this uh, as i have explained this any so it denotes this not equal uh, so we are checking here whether the input is not equal to null pointer and after that we go for this uh, dimensions of the input so uh, to do this we assert that it is uh, uh, since the input tensor should be of two dimension we can assert the value of the size is 2 we are respecting a two dimensional tensor uh, containing uh, one in each dimension so we can assert that both dimension contain a single element so we will be uh, yeah and after that uh, Uh, and uh, after that we are feeding uh, the data variable uh, yeah here uh, to run the interference we are feeding the input data value zero and uh, we are invoking the status in the interpreter is invoked here when the interpreter is invoked the invoke status is set to kt life okay if it is not equal to kt life okay that means this invoke has failed so we just report it and uh, when it is the invoke status equal to kt life okay again we check here equal and we check for the output here and before checking for the output we check whether the dimensions of the uh, output so yeah here we are checking the dimensions of the output then yeah here uh, we are so so finally so as we saw earlier uh, this uh, assess the difference between uh, its first argument and the second argument so yeah it might be confusing you because okay we will be providing you the book reference so everything is written there so i know these things uh, take time to say, uh, sink in so you can go uh, refer that book so here what i am doing so the first uh, so uh, it uh, the difference between first argument and second argument is less than the third argument it checks this the difference between the first argument and second argument it is less than the third argument so it, it works this way and finally so now uh, so it is what uh, this uh, here written here right and then uh, just a minute yeah so finally what i am doing here i am taking the brightness are you able to see this the font is very uh, let's say yes yeah so yeah the so finally uh, i am blinking the led now i am i am uh, i will be compiling it and will be uploading this code to the arduino and uh, the brightness is uh, as you can see this here the value y underscore value so y underscore value will be uh, varying from minus 1 to 1 right the sine wave the output value so accordingly the brightness will be adjusted when the y value is minus 1 the brightness will be zero and zero when y value is zero it will be intermediate and y value reaches 1 the brightness will be maximum and the same i am going to write into the led so now i am connecting uh, this to the arduino Yeah, and I'll be uploading it. It takes a time. Yeah, you know, compile and upload it.
okay we will be providing you the book reference uh, i know these things uh, take time to sink in so you can refer the book if you have uh, not understood uh, uh, whatever i have explained especially the code thing well uh, yes uh, so uh, we will be sharing that book so i understand that um, those those apis that maybe you may be having the logic but what api you will used for this platform that you will get that list in that book okay from there you can page and uh, actually you can uh, take this as an first uh, example as a model and inside there some parts you will change and you will have to do the your assignment so fill this up so ogotam i think for this first week let them do this i mean let them set up the environment and the this only this led blinking this code let them run and they will do their one their video i mean their execution and they will submit okay okay, okay. Yeah. I, i think by that way they will get the feel of the environment mm -hmm. and then we will can go for that next actual assignment like, yeah right so that will help so first we will share the book based on that the, whatever he had shown that same example you will create in your environment you will run the code you will um, i mean uh, do a recording of that your output and that you will out, um, upload as a as a um, i mean outcome of your assignment okay so maybe next week you show them that uh, that oh, hello yeah then oh, they will go do that okay google part otherwise it could be confusing ma'am yes do we have to do you need to upload the screen recording uh, uh, not the recording you can take the screenshot and screen that yeah that Once mm -hmm. I click on, you can take the screenshot, and then that will do. Yes, yeah, done uploading. Uh, can see the video, right? Hello. Yes. Yeah, it's blinking. Can see uh, this LED. This is blinking. You might not see it clearly. Okay, that is your first this thing. Just go through the chapters. Actually, we'll be sharing the book reference. Uh, go through the chapter number uh, uh, four, five, six. So, go the one thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the first thing is that they may not be having the um, the Arduino board, right? So, and actually, so how can they see that output? Oh yeah. Okay, that. Ma'am, can can this, be, can this yeah. same thing be performed in an Arduino Uno board? Yes, yeah. the Arduino Uno also will do. Yeah, but the problem is uh, for the next assignment, the wakeboard detection. Yeah. Uh, you need an inbuilt microphone as well. Yes, Arduino for this Uno, assignment, if you are having uh, Arduino Uno for this assignment, the LED blinking part it will do no problem. But for next, uh, you will be seeing the, some. Based on some voice detection, then based on some camera, so those parts will not do. But for this part, if you have Arduino, you know you can try for it. Go for it. Okay. 
Okay, ma'am. Okay, sure. For others who are not having uh, this uh, any Arduino board, so we will figure out something. Okay, so how we can see in the software platform this output? Maybe we can take this to that. We will let you know. Uh, present. You just set up this, run that code, and try to get a feel. How to submit the output for this first assignment? We will let you know. Okay. You can work on the Google Colab, the training of the model, and uh, mm -hmm. you can analyze the graphs. Yeah, you can do that. We can check with other softwares, right? Go on like Proteus or something else. If we can yes, show them here and can show them the this linking in the software itself. I mean, yeah. That, that we will first taste then then we will share with them. Okay. Do you have any questions? Just for that sine wave assignment, or the that example also. Try to change the layers, number of layers, and see what is the difference in the output. That way, you will get the feeling. So I think that's all for today. So if you have any question, you can ask. Otherwise, we will upload this document and these uh, four related links to, uh, to this assignment in this uh, Teams itself. So check there and try to set up the environment.